Now therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that they may not live and go process the land which the Lord God of your fathers given you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I commanded thee, neither diminish from it, that ye may keep my commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did, because you're, you're a Belixifor of all the men uh, who followed Belixifor. The Lord thy God hath destroyed them from thy mouth among you, but ye that did not cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go and process it. Keep therefore and add to do them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the, of the nations, which shall hear all these statues and say, Surely this is a great nation, is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who have God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that he hath statutes and judgments, so righteousness as all this law, only take heed thyselves and keep thy souls dif difference, lest thou forget things with thy eyes. Have seen and last thou depart from the heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Spark, especially the day thou stoodest before the Lord thy God. Or read, when the Lord said unto the gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days of that they shall live upon the earth, that they may teach their children. And ye came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, and the darkness clouds and thick darkness. And the Lord speak unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard a voice of the woods, but saw no silver to, only he heard the voice. And he de declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to be perform even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me that at the time to teach the you statutes and judgments that ye might do them in the land whither ye go over and possess it. Take therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similar to, similar to on the day that the Lord speak unto you, Horred and Horred, out of the midst of the fire. Last ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image to the sim similar to of any fi fire and the likeness of male or female. The likeness of any beast is that on the earth, likeness of any wind, which or flow the village, the air, the likeness of any thing that creepeth on ground, and the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. At least thou, thou lift up thy eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun, 
and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, should be driven to worship them and serve them. With the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But the Lord hath taken you and bought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt to be unto him a people of interest as ye are this day. Furnace, furnace, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swore that I should not go over Jordan that and that I should not go in unto the good land with the Lord thy God giveth thee for unto such and true I must die this in this land I must not go over Jordan but ye shall go over and possess that good land take heed unto yourselves lest that ye forget the commandments of the Lord your God with ye made with you and make you a graven image or likewise of likeness of anything with in the Lord thy God have forbidden thee for the Lord thy God is consuming consumer fire even as a jealous God when thou begat children and children's children and ye shall have remained along in the land and shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image or likewise of anything and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God promote him angry I call heaven and earth and to witness against you this day that ye shall soon untrue from off the land whither whereunto ye go over Jordan and possess it ye shall not prolong your days upon it but shall unless be destroyed and the Lord shall sacred you among the nations and ye shall be left a few in number among the heavens whither the Lord shall lead you lead you and there ye shall serve gods in the work of men men's hands wood stone whither neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell but it but if from thy thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, all these things are come upon thee. Even in the later days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient unto his voice for the Lord thy God is a merciful God he will not forsake thee neither destroy thee nor forget the commandment covenant thy fathers with he were swore unto thee them forsake now the days that are past with where before these since the day that God created man upon the earth and the ark from one side of heaven unto un, unto another whether there have been any such thing as this great thing is or have heard like it did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard and lived or have God decided to go and take him 
a nation from the midst of another nation, and, temp and temptation by sight, and wonders by war, and by my hands, my hands, and by statues out arms, and by great terror, according to all that the Lord your God did for your you in Egypt before your eyes. Unto thee it swore that thou mightst know that the Lord he is God, there is none else besides him. Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice, that he might instruct thee in upon the earth. He swore thee his great fire, and thou heardest, heardest his words out of the midst of fire. And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he sight with his might power out of Egypt to drive out the nations from before thee greater and mightier than thou art to bring thee in the to give thee their land for the and it hoard as it this day. Know therefore this day thou considerest it in thine heart that the Lord he is God in heaven above, above and upon the earth beneath there is none else. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments which I commanded thee this day that it may go well with thee and with thy children's af children after earth with the Lord the, thy God giveth thee forever. Then Moses served their cities on the side of Jordan towards the and that Sile might feel therefore with should kill his neighbor, un, unworse and hated him. In times past, at that feeling unto one of these cities he might live, namely Brazil, Brazil in the wilderness in the plain concern of the Rukhbury and Ram and Guild of the Gabbis and Gongwen and Bashin of Messias. And this is the law with Moses sat before children of Israel. There are the tes testimonies of the statutes of the judgments with Moses speak unto the children of Israel after they came forth out of Egypt. On this side of Jordan, in the valley over a site, Bethiophor, in the land of Shihon, king of the Amorites, who dwell at Hezbon, who Moses and the children of Israel smote after thee were come forth out of Egypt. And they possessed his land, and the land of Ogar, king of Bethshem, two kings and the Lord with were on this side of Jordan towards the Tyrannians from Or Amar with his the bank of the river Aaron even unto the mountain Zion with the Huron all the plants on this side Jordan eastward even unto the sea of plain unto strip, strips of 
Cool ice cream. First hand, we pray. All right, Father Lord, we just thank you for uh, this day, Lord. We thank you for uh, this reading, and we just ask you to bless Josh as he brings forth the reading that may edify us and give us knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good job, Brother Vince. You did a fine job. I gave him almost no, no notice for that, so he did a great job. Those names, nobody can pronounce the names. Don't worry. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'm talking today about the Lord's stretched out arm. The Lord's stretched out arm is what we'll be dealing with. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 1, we've got a warning and a charge given. Verse 1 says, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes, and unto the judgments which I teach you, which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that follow Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land where you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So here are the warning and the charges given. There's a curse clearly promised to those that would not obey or hear the word and a blessing promised to those that do. This is how God always works, in, especially in the Old Testament scriptures. This wasn't a for sure promise. And I got this little thing I keep in my notebook. The land promises are conditional. So in my Bible, this is always floating around there just in case it ever comes up. And I have written in here every time where God says, if ye will, I will. If ye will, I will. And it's it's... It's exhaustive, the list. It just keeps going and going and going. I ran out of space to put all the times where God says, Hey, if ye obey my commandments, I will bless you in the land. That negates the nation that's over there sitting on God's turf, claiming to be of the promised seed. Because they're not obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not obeying the commandments of the Lord. They're not even obeying the Old Testament scriptures that are contained there in ordinances. It's a fraud. But here God promises the blessing if you do these things and the curse if you don't. And I love this. He says, this is your wisdom and understanding. This is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of all the nations which shall hear of these statutes. And it's proclaimed from them. God prophesied that they would say this when they looked at the nation that obeyed God. They would say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Now, they may not give God the glory, but they certainly would look and say, these guys got something figured out. I don't know how often you've heard it. It doesn't happen too often, but every once in a while, somebody will say to you, you got something that I want. They, they're wondering how you're succeeding in your job. They're wondering how you're succeeding in caring for your house. They're wondering how you're succeeding generally in your life. And it's because you're following God's statutes. Amen. And if you follow his statutes, that's why you appear wise. That's why you appear as an understanding people before this nation that we dwell in. But if we're not, obviously the contrary part is the same. We will be looked at as a byword and a proverb if we're just people that are following after the ways of this world. Especially if we're someone that is named the name of Christ and we're not doing these things. It's a folly. It's a shame unto us, of course. Amen. Amen. He says, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Now where we're standing today, okay... Is there anyone in the world that you think that's looking at the nation of Canada and saying, surely this is a wise and understanding people? Yeah, right. How often are we mocked and ridiculed among people, even among our neighbors to the south? Most people would think we're just a bunch of a bunch of teethless bumpkins walking around in flannel. Part of that is true. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that we're not looked at as an understanding people or a wise people because we're not obeying God's statutes. And that's clear. But God here explains his purpose clearly in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And it's the same purpose that I believe he has for the nation of Canada today. And here is his purpose. Look at verse 20. Verse 20 says this. 
But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I should not go over this Jordan, that I should not go into that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an, inhabit for an inheritance. It continues on, if you were to read down in verse 24, where it says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. What was this charge? Verse 23, Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire and a jealous God. What is his plan for the people of Canada? That he would take people for himself an inheritance out of the iron furnace. He did the same thing in Egypt. He didn't go in and save the whole nation of Egypt. No, he had a peculiar people that followed his judgments, followed his statutes, followed his word, and he chose them. How were they divided? Very particularly by the judgments that came forth, God started to separate the, the sheep from the goats. God began to celebrate, se separate the Egyptians from the people of Israel. To the end, that in the end, when it would all wrap up, he would have his people bringing them out as they put the blood on the doorpost, marked forever as his own. He wants to take people out of the fire, which is the world, the iron furnace, and he wants to bring them into the fire, which is himself. Amen. That's what it says in verse 24. He, the Lord God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. He doesn't want us mingled. He doesn't want us wrapped up in the things of this world. He wants to take us and pluck us out of the fire and bring us into his own self, his own fire. He's drawing people out of the nations, out of this world, and bringing them unto himself. Look at verse 29. Verse 29 says, But if from thence, from where you're at right now, thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. So he's talking to a nation that had backslidden, a nation that was deemed to be utterly perishing in the ways that they were walking in. But he promises a prolonging of the days should they heed his warning. And he says, if from thence, if from the, the wickedness of your life, if from thence, if from your unbelieving heart, if from thence, from your backslidden and wretched lifestyle that you have, if from thence ye shall seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find them. What a great promise. If where you're standing right now, if you seem far from God, seek him, you shall find him. If from where you're standing right now, you're not hearing God's word, seek him, you shall find him, is what he promises. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul, when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which ye swear unto them. For ask now in the days that are past, which went before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven even unto the other, whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing, or hath been heard like it. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard and live? Or hath God a say to go and to take him a nation, here it is, from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand, by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. What is God promising here? He's saying that this nation had a particular treasure, had a particular blessing. And what was it? Hey, even though they were backslidden, even though they were far from God, he said, seek me, you shall find me. If you find me, if you're obedient to the voice of me crying out to you, you will find my mercy. He says, look around you. Ask, have you ever seen something such as this? Where God would pluck out a nation from within a nation unto himself. 
Has anyone ever seen where God would take and give temptations and signs and wonders and war and his mighty arm and his stretched out hand and the great terrors and use them to draw people unto himself? Has that ever happened before? Where we're standing, we can look at Egypt. These things are written for our examples. And it's wonderful because in verse 30, he uses that term, latter days. Hey, that connects it right to the time in which we're living where God, I believe, is doing the exact same thing. Here we are in Canada, as it was in Egypt, so as it in the latter days. As it is happening and beginning to unfold in this world at large, as we're hearing wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes, and the signs are before us where things are just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. People are deceiving and being deceived. All of these things are coming to pass. Would you agree? Amen. As this thing is ramping up, we are beginning to see what God, I believe, is referring to as the latter days, when he's going to take a nation out of a nation. And here we are in Canada in that great big iron furnace, and God wants to pull out a people for himself and bring them into the fire of himself. As we've witnessed in Great Britain, where Satan has, is nearly omnipresent, he's nearly everywhere. He's mimicking the, the ability of God to see everything. Where you can't step on a square foot of Britain without being recorded by CCTV. Where there's nowhere you can hide without being under the watchful eye of Big Brother there. Satan himself. Where, where there's that horde of that rebellious and hypocritical nation upon them. Where that, that nation is literally under the terror of an op opposing nation. Of, of a heathen nation. Of, of Islam itself moving in and taking over. We see them under that judgment. We see in Australia where one day they're lifting up the pride flags and the next day the fire is falling on them. Where we see literally abortion rights skyrocketing where people can get away with whatever they want with regard to reproductive rights. We, we've seen biblical preaching being banned, silence, no freedom of speech granted in such a place. And God continues to withhold the rain so that he wouldn't even quench the fires that are upon them. And yet when we analyze these scenarios, especially with respect to Australia, do you realize that Canada is more of a haven for the proud sodomites? Do you realize that Canada is more of a haven for silencing of biblical persuasion and biblical voices? Right. Do you realize that our abortion rights are far surpassed that nation of Australia? And yet we don't see the fire, but wait, it's coming. God intends by temptations, by signs, by wonders, by war, by mighty hand, and by his outstretched arm and the great terrors that he has promised for us to take us out of this nation. Amen. But that doesn't sound like a fun experience. Right? But I believe God will protect us. And if you look to Exodus, you find the same thing. Where the plagues fell on the nation, and God's nation within it was protected and saved from the carnage, saved from the wrath. But that doesn't mean we're not going to experience some things. We're going to be hurt by them, some of these things. We're going to have these things fall upon us. These are just the beginning of sorrows. The end is not yet. Right? He promised. And so expect this. Because like I said, Britain's a wicked nation. Like I said, Australia is a wicked nation, but hello, Canada is far worse. <laughs> you, you line it up. I mean, I expect it. I, I've, I've said this mantra over and over where I've said, you know, Great Britain is here, and then five years behind, Australia is following in their sinful wickedness, and then five years behind that, Canada is. And I expect it, since I've said it so much, that it would be true. And when I looked it up, the, the, the writing's on the wall. We are far, far, far worse than Australia. There's still, there's still provinces in Australia where, where you, will be, you, will be, you will be put to prison for aborting late term. There, there's, there is no limitations. I mean, if, if the baby is still inside, you can abort in Canada, okay? Nothing. But yet there's still provinces in, in Australia where there are limitations, where they have some sort of freedom of speech, where they have some sort, and yet they're on fire. And we sit here and go, oh, you, you know, God's judging them. Well, we should wait. We should expect that that, that will be next. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> in times like these, people start to think, you know, 
oh, come on, that's not really really God bringing the fire upon the people. And, and you know what? I, I, I may agree, Isaiah chapter 9, I may agree that God didn't set that fire, okay? But his protecting hand wasn't necessarily on it. And from what I understand, down in Australia, it's routine to have these fires um, every year. But the major difference is, is that the rain has been withheld. Okay, so they've been in extreme drought, therefore the fire just took off. And who brings the rain? The Lord. Who, who could have withhold these things from happening to them? The Lord. And, and who are they completely ignoring in their ways and in their walk? The Lord. Okay. And so it's not, it's not astonishing that a preacher could stand up and say, hey, the judgment of God is upon this place. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 17 says, Therefore the Lord, and I read this, and I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't get away from it. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on the fatherless and widows. For every one is an hypocrite, speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burneth as a fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle in the thickets of the forest. And they shall mount up like the lifting of a smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened. And the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. God is revealing here as, as he is a consuming fire, so his wrath consumes. We've talked about this before in the sermon, the presence of the Lord. That his, his protection is upon those that are in Christ standing in his presence. But when God intervenes in the affairs of men, if you're not protected, if you're not obeying him as a nation, expect that your men would be as briars and thorns and even fuel for the fire as God moves into a nation. The wrath of God will burn a nation. The wrath of God will also withheld what is needful to stop the burning, to quench the fires, being the rain. The Lord is jealous. He is a consuming fire, but he still desires to reach people, and so he judges. Okay, so all that we're witnessing there, the, the, the burning, the torment, the, 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 the anguish, the people losing everything, people dying. Are you saying that's just an act of mercy? Yeah, in a lot of ways it is, okay? Because what this nation is experiencing is God moving in to separate from and for himself a people, a peculiar people from that whole nation. Hey, there's an iron furnace here, a burning ague, wickedness, heathens. You want nothing to do with God. So God burns so that he would draw men unto himself. Because there are going to be people that recognize the hand of God in this scenario and turn to him and call out to him. So should we pray for Australia? Yeah, absolutely. Pray that God's purposes will be fulfilled. Pray that people, the remnant that is there, will respond to God and see that they're being rebuked, see that they're being corrected, see that they're being chastened by His hand. God here, as it said in Deuteronomy chapter 4, is intending to take a nation from within that nation, to separate for himself a peculiar people that is zealous for the works that he has for them. And he's going to do it just as he promised in Deuteronomy. He's going to do it with temptations. He's going to do it with signs. He's going to do it with wonders. And we've seen all that. People are reporting sights in the clouds and all these things are going on and people are having having visions and, and, and all these things are going on as the fires consume them. There is war and his mighty hand is stretched out arm is what's bringing all these terrors upon a nation that has long ago rejected and forgotten the Lord. God did this before the eyes of the Egyptians as a witness that my people are different and they are coming out of you. And today, I believe he is doing the same thing. He is before our eyes, taking a nation ahead of us and burning it to the ground in order that he could bring out people that would repent and believe on him and trust him. And get right! Let's pray for that remnant to respond. Let's pray that God would get his nation and his plans would be fulfilled. In the end of Deuteronomy, it says, Know therefore this day... And consider it in thine heart. 
He brings it to the day that we're living in. As he said, the latter day, and as he said at the end of that chapter in Deuteronomy 4, know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart. Remember, and this is what he constantly does. We see this time and time and time again. In Isaiah chapter 9, you're going to see it, I think, four different times where he says, for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is outstretched still. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is outstretched still. And I always thought, I have it highlighted in my Bible where I said, for all this his anger is not turned away but his hand is outstretched still and I considered that because I'm in the standpoint of a believer as God's mercy coming upon the judgment in yellow I got it highlighted and green is that mercy and that love extended back to his people but the reality is is that that stretched out hand we will see in scriptures it can be either it can be God's mercy or it can be his continual punishment for all this his anger is not turned away but his hand is outstretched still He's going to continue to fight against you. He's going to continue to battle against you. He's going to continue to war against you and to bring you through temptations and these signs and these wonders to fulfill his desired end of all of these things. That stretched out, that mighty hand of God is either a blessing or it's a curse depending on whose side you're on and where you stand. Go to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. In dealing with the stretched out hand, Luke chapter 22 and verse 52, when Jesus is about to be crucified, at least taken before the judgment, he says to his, his attackers, he says to his captors, he says, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. The stretched out hand was a sign of power or intent. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's a sign of my intent is to go forth. This is my outstretched hand. This is my power. This is my intent. This is what I'm showing you. And Jesus said, hey, you didn't stretch forth your hand at me. You didn't come at me and show yourself to be against me. You didn't come at me when I was daily at peace and, temp and, and, and in the temple and available, right, for you to come at me, ask me questions, come at me, come at me and take me. He says, no. But rather, this is the hour and the power of darkness, he said. That you're going to do it under concealment of darkness. But that's what's happening. The stretched out arm is showing the power of, and intent of what's about to happen. To Jeremiah in the Old Testament, when God revealed his stretched out hand, all he could say is, there, there is nothing too hard for thee. When God showed his purpose and his intent and his plan by stretching out his hand upon a nation, upon a people, he said, there is nothing too hard for thee. Just, just in awe of the power of God to do his will. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6 says, Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And today I believe, as a written scripture for our samples, we can have the same thing and apply it unto our own lives. God says to us, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Canadians. <laughs> I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And the reason why we laugh at that is because it's, it's, almost, it's almost mocking when, when, you, when you think about the limp wrist nation that we have, right? I mean, I mean, maybe God is moving in on Great Britain and on Australia because, because their, their pride is so high and they're, they actually have something to back it up, right? We don't got much here. But the, but the reality is, is that the liberality that we have been given has, has, has bent us to just constant and, per, and, and perpetual backsliding from God. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And yeah, we may not feel... The bondage of being overlorded by the Canadian government or by the Canadian military. 
We don't have that right now. We don't have that same thing where the greatest military in the world is over top of us and putting us into bondage and servitudes. That would be a joke, right? But today, I still feel that great burden of being in and under this nation. Because though the presence physically isn't felt of the oppression that we have, the spiritual oppression is real. This nation is bent towards God. The, the public schools, the, the public venues, everything is ultimately being, being directed in a, in a way that is against God and in opposition. And I feel that great burden today being under this nation. I believe this nation is soon going to feel the mighty stretched out arm of God. And it will happen as more and more and more. Verse 5 comes to pass. It says, And I have heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. God promised to separate us. God promised to draw us unto himself. God gave us a covenant with a promised land attached to it. And God wants us to have those things. He wants us to have success in the Christian life. He wants us to grow in the things of God. And his end will be satisfied. Redemption is nigh as the groaning of God's people increases. God will start to turn his hand and to turn his hand. And the only reason that Canadian Christians are crying out to God is I think we're placated at the moment. I think we got a little bit too much fluoride in the brain. I think we're just a little too happy with watching television. We're just a little too content with playing our video games. We're just a little too impressed with all of the entertainments that we have at our disposal. We're content. We're good. No one's groaning unto God. But the reality is, is it's wicked here. It's wrong here. We should be mourning. We should be at a loss for words except ones that are uttered before the God in heaven. Redemption is on nine. As we start to get unplugged, Christians, as we start to get offline, Christians, as we start to get in the word of God, Christians, you're going to start to see the scales will be removed. This nation is wicked and getting worse. And as it does, you will be vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. You will be vexed with ungodliness that's put before you. You will be vexed with the things that you even see in the grocery aisle. But the problem is, we walk to the grocery aisle in the checkout, we see all these half-naked women in front of us, and it doesn't bother us, because some of us go home and look at half-naked women anyways in the comfort of our own home. We've grown up and we've come, become accustomed to the wickedness that's before us. And this is why we're not growing. And this is why God's hand isn't on the nation. The best thing that could happen to us as a nation and as a spiritual nation of Israel within Canada is something like Australia. And yet it's not happening. Why does the judgment of God linger? What are his Christians doing? I believe God's going to use his people in a great way, especially in the last days. If you were to look at Exodus chapter 8, talking about God's outstretched hand, I believe that in the last days, the great exploits that the Bible refers to in the book of Daniel are, 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 are akin to the type of great exploits that you see Moses and Aaron doing in Exodus. Okay, so God wants to stretch out his hand upon the Egyptians so that he can pull the people out unto himself. Look at Exodus chapter 8, verse 6. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. 8, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Look, God wants to stretch out a rod. He wants to stretch out his arm. He wants to stretch out and show himself strong. Verse 17, And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Exodus 9 and verse 22. 9 and verse 22. And the Lord said that God's going to move again in the hand of the Egyptians, in the land of Egypt. He's going to move in the world. The Lord said to Moses, what does he say? I'm going to do this. Here's my next step. Get ready. I'm going to... No, he says to Moses, the man of God, stretch forth thine hand toward heaven that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt upon men and upon beasts and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven and it came to pass. 10 verse 12. 10 and verse 12. 
And the Lord said again unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt, over the world that's before you, over that fiery furnace that's consuming you, that's oppressing you, that's daily vexing your righteous soul. Stretch out thy hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even as all that the hail hath left. The judgment of God coming as he pronounces to his people, stretch out your hand. Show your power, show your might in the sight of this world. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt. 10 verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was what? Exactly what God promised. If you look in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 21. Exodus 14 verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all the night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went in the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued. So we see God acts by the hand of his man Moses to cause his great miracle to come. And the Egyptians, verse 23, pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea. Even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians. He looks and beholds the world as he's drawing his people through the waters. As he's bringing his people through that cleansing fountain. He looks back upon that world through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. It just makes it hard for them to get at God's people. And he took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, here it is again, stretch out thy hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And all the people and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. God's great revelation to them was in a time of what? Trouble and terrors. God's great revelation and his moving in their lives was a time of temptations, of signs and wonders. Some of the greatest miracles ever recorded in scriptures. There was a great war as their people, completely outnumbered and out, outweaponed, were taken, were, were, were chased after, were sought after. And then there was God's mighty hand and stretched out arm to carry them through it. But as it always is, you can't be lukewarm in this battle. There wasn't the people that were half in with the Egyptians and half in with Israel. There was a clear divide separated by the Lord God in a pillar of fire and a pillar and cloud of smoke. Completely divided, one after God seeking after him and one after the world and seeking after them. So God's people, if they want to get involved in the fight, if they want to be that peculiar people, zealous in the works that God has for them, need to be clear and distinct in their separation. They need to be fully on board with God. And look what happens when they're fully on board. Through the temptations, through the signs, the wonders, the war, God has his mighty hand upon them to the end that they're just strolling through this thing on dry ground. They're just comfortable through it all as all these miracles are happening. It took the man of God who was given the instruction of God to stand out and to put his arm out in God's stead. And after that, the rest of the people just went for a stroll. Just went for a walk on dry ground on the beach. 
Okay? Well, God was doing a work in their day in order that when they got to the other side of the trouble, they got to the other side of the tribulation, they got to the other side of the struggle, they were preserved and they were separated. Unto what? Well, God did that good work, verse 31, so that the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and followed the servant Moses further. God's going to start one by one picking off these nations that are proud and lofty. One by one just going in and wreaking havoc on these lands that are puffed up and think that they're something. On the Sodoms of this world. On the Gomorrahs of this world. On the, on the Egypts of this world. In order that his people would seek him and walk through the troubles that are coming on dry ground. So that in the end, God has people separated from himself. For himself. The great delivery from for God's people brings great glory for the Almighty God. And this is all he wants to do. In the sight of all the nations, take a bunch of people that fear God and believe him and are following the man of God and take them through great exploits where he does all the work, he gets all the glory. We just get to stick our hands out in his stead and watch. See, behold, the Lord God shall fight for you, he promises. Quite often when you're reading through the scriptures, he is always calling this event to remembrance. He's always talking about when I brought you out of Egypt. In a similar fashion where it says that the Lord thy God brought thee thence through a mighty hand and through a stretched out arm. He brought you from Egypt with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. He's always just bringing this back to remembrance. And every time he does, it's to just show off his mighty arm. Show off his stretched out hand. That he accomplished his purpose for his people so that his people would be his own. And more so fearing God. And more so believing God. And more so ready for what's ahead. Turn to Isaiah chapter 14. So are we surprised today when we see God intervening in the affairs of men? Are we surprised when we see God, like I said, picking off these nations one by one? Britain under Satan's eye of surveillance. Australia burning to the ground. What of Canada? It's coming. God's purpose and his plan will come to his intended end. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24. The Bible says, The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. That I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? God is a picture with Assyria oppressing Israel in their land. Is saying that, hey, Christians, as Joshua promised, on every place the sole of your foot treadeth, there I've given you dominion. That's a picture of the Christian life. We're to walk this Christian life, right? And God's given us spiritual dominion every step of the way, one step after another. You have authority over principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in this world, never mind the Canadian government, the spiritual wickedness that is over it all, that is keeping us all numb to what's going on, that is keeping us all blind to what's going on. That spiritual principality over it all is oppressing us. And yet every step of the way through promise of God, you have dominion and authority, dominion and authority. Walk in that dominion and authority that the scriptures have given you. And as they oppress you, hey, don't fear, don't fret, seek unto God, cry unto God. And what has he promised? That as he will do throughout the entire earth, he will stretch out his hand. He has purposed to perform exactly what he has promised in your life and in the life of this nation. God has purposed it. Who's going to disannul that? Okay, God has stretched out his hand and who is going to push it out of the way? Who's going to remove God's hand from acting in a scenario? Now, I believe God's purpose and plan will come as intended and to the intended end. And here we are in this nation. And there's a nation here in this room 
spiritual Israel that is under the oppression of the queer principalities that are over top of us, that are manning the government, that are working behind the scenes to keep our nation this way, God will break forth and will destroy and will put underfoot and release us from this yoke. So what do we got to do? Get on his side. The Bible says, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is outstretched still. Is his hand stretched out in your life in just more wrath? Is, is, is his anger towards what's going on in this nation? And then when he looks at you as a believer, is he just, you know, pushing it down harder? Keeping his hand stretched out so that he could provoke you, he could set you ablaze, he could get you out of there, he could correct you, he could rebuke you? Or is this this case where all his anger is not turned away from this nation, but his hand is outstretched to you, believer, in mercy that he could carry you through this? you got to decide today. You want God's stretched out arm to be wrath in your life, or do you want his stretched out arm to be great mercy, provision, care in this life? I mean, we just had a scare. The stupid government sent some uh, warning at 7.30 in the morning that there's like a nuclear meltdown. And I'm already texting Miss Alex and Brother Jamie, like, you guys can come here. But the reality is, is that would do no good. I mean, I looked at the map. If something like Chernobyl happened over here, there's, there, you're not getting anywhere. I mean, I mean the, the radius of complete, almost instant death destruction, those, those 10 kilometers, the people are gone like that, okay? It's, 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 it's serious, right? But the reality is, is that should God decide to use something like an event over there, seismic activity that caused an earthquake, that whole thing slips into the ocean, the, all the waters there are made bitter, the radiation just busts out of that thing, all of southern Ontario is just instantly affected by it, the first, second, and third 10 kilometer rings of that thing, people are immediately having their skin fall off, I'm sorry if I'm graphic, but, but the outside of that cancer just hits you and escalates to the point where you're, you're completely dead due to, due to, due to mutilated cells within, within days. You know, all the way up to the, the northern rim of, uh, of, of cottage country, Bracebridge and whatnot. The, the clouds just pouring up there and is affecting all these people in that same way. Everyone's dropped. If God should decide to do something like that to this nation, it is completely within his power to do so. But would to God, and wouldn't it be wonderful if through those temptations and through those signs and through those wonders... God would have his people just taking a stroll on the beach. Yeah. Right? Amen. Just taking a stroll on the beach. That's God's intended plan for his people in the last days. Okay? The people that are sold out. The people that are blood-bought. The people that are pursuing after God. The people that aren't distracted, aren't caught up in this world, aren't, are, 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 are just deluded with the perversion that's going on around them, that are focused, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of God, those are the ones that are going to do exploits. Those are the ones going to be going for a stroll when everyone else is getting consumed Amen. by the floods. That's what God wants for you. That's the calling that he has for you. His calling to some believers today. You can go to Jeremiah chapter 21. we got to decide what we want, okay? God's a gentleman. I've heard that many years in my Christian walk. God's a gentleman. He's not going to force his hand upon anybody. If you want blessings, he'll extend it. He'll offer it. He's not going to force you to get blessed. Jeremiah chapter 21 and verse 4 says, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, wherewith ye fight against the king of Babylon, against the Chaldeans, which besiege you without the walls, and I will assemble them into the midst of the city. Okay, what is this talking about? They were trying to defend themselves against the oncoming trouble, tribulation, attacks of the wicked one. And God says, hey, I'll just turn those weapons back against yourself. Who's he talking to? Jeremiah, who's talking to the people of Israel, the backslidden people of Israel in his days. God's chosen people. He says in verse 5, And I myself will fight against you. With an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. And I will smite the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast, and they shall die of a great pestilence. And afterwards, saith the Lord, 
I will deliver Zedekiah king of Judah and his servants and the people and such as are left in this city from the pestilence and from the sword and from the famine into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those that seek their life and he shall smite them with the edge of the sword. He shall not spare them neither shall he have pity neither shall he have mercy. That sounds depressing. That's God's warning to the people that have rebelled against him and refused to get it right. He had given the command that says, hey, just, just give in. Throw in the white flag. Nebuchadnezzar is here. He's bigger than you. He's stronger than you. He's going to take you over. Just give up and I will care for you. Completely contrary to what you'd expect. How about this? Big, big nuclear explosion goes down there. First thing we want to do is get out. What if God says, stable it? Okay? This is, this is people having to take a faith walk based on the challenge that God's put before them. And I believe some people that are more backslidden are going to have more bigger leaps of faith to make in order to, to, to basically get into this fight, to, to get through what's coming to them. But anyways, he's saying, and he's calling people to repent, otherwise he's going to literally fight against them. In verse 8 it says, And unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, before I set before you the way of life and the way of death. God says, hey, make a choice. Here is my word. Do it and live. Don't do it, worse things will come upon you. This is God's challenge for his people because, because they have been backslidden for so long. And here we are as Christians in Canada. We're to be in this nation, but not of this nation. In the world, but not of the world. God's stretched out arm will push us to where he wants us to be. And this is going to be this is going to be the thing. We're going to have the choice to make. God's going to come in and intervene in this nation. It's just a matter of time. And when he does so with his great temptations, with his great trials, with his great he's going to be talking about his great word. He's going to be speaking to us. And those that are listening and are ready and willing to obey it, God's stretched out hand will be a blessing in your life. If we're not as separate as we should be, you're ready. He will separate us. And he'll do it by the trials that we are soon to be facing. Go to Ezekiel chapter 16. Be, I think, the last spot. Jeremiah is Another warning to his people. They need to get separated before he starts separating. Ezekiel chapter 16. Verse 26. Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh. Thou hast increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore I have stretched out my hand over thee, okay? And have diminished thine ordinary food, and delivered thee into the will of them that hate thee. The daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd ways. Even the heathen are ashamed of the way some Christians live. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast insatiable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldee, and yet thou wast not satisfied therewith. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things. We've got to ask ourselves today. Okay, there's people that are committing spiritual fornication. There's people that are committing real fornication that would call themselves Christians. And yet God here is giving, as he always does, that silver lining of, of grace where he could cause somebody who is right before him to walk through the midst of the fiery furnace, to walk through... The, 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 the rivers and the floods that are overflowing the banks of the Jordan. They could, they could walk through great trials and tribulations if they would only seek God with their whole heart. Yet for some of us, he's going to have to take our provision and diminish it. He's going to have to put an enemy in our house and, and cause him to rule over us. And if we continue to be unsatiable and unsatisfied and covetous in the way we live our lives, always wanting more, never being satisfied, never just saying the Lord is enough and seeking after him, then the question needs to be asked, how weak is thine heart because thou doest these things? How weak is your heart that, that you would choose yourself over God? 
How, how weak is your heart that you would choose food for your belly over, over walking in the faith for our Lord? How weak is your heart that you would choose rebellion over religion, over walking in the ways of God, loving thy neighbor as thyself? taking care of the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keeping yourself unspotted from the world. How weak is your heart when you'd rather rebel in every aspect of your life? How weak is your heart that you'll choose smut over scriptures? So God stretches out his hand. He judges, he rebukes, he does it with all power and all authority as he has always done and as he will continue to do as he enacts his will in this world. Like I said, he gives every individual the ability, the opportunity to choose him. God stretches out his hand. Is it going to be power that crushes and destroys you with this world? Or is it going to be power that extends mercy to you and carries you through what's going to happen? I think every one of us sitting here would, would, would say, yeah, I want, I want the blessings of God. I want the provision of God. I want, I want God to carry me through what's to come. You've got a choice to make. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face. Because I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge out from among you the rebels. And them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Egypt, Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. What's God doing here? Same thing he's going to do in these last days. He's purging his people. He's bringing out to himself a people peculiar, zealous unto good works, because he's got big plans for the last days. And he wants his people to be involved in his plans. He wants to be able to look at the brothers and sisters in this room, and as he did to Moses, just say, stretch out thy hand, so lice will be upon them. Yes, Lord. Stretch out your hand, so the fires will fall. Yes, Lord. Stretch out your hand and witness the mighty power of God. Yes, yes, Lord. He's purging this nation. He's purging the nations of this world one by one by one by one to the end that he would have a people peculiar, zealous to the works that are before them. That would be that group that does great exploits in these last days. Look what he's doing. His mighty hand comes in. Fury poured out that he would rule over you. He's bringing out that people from all the countries where they are scattered, continuing to pour his fury. He's taking the people into the wilderness. And in his great mercy, those that are still being rebellious, he's pleading with them face to face as he did when he walked into the mount. And, and the fires came down. And the people hit the ground. And they said, Moses, man of God, you go talk to the Lord. I can't hear his voice anymore. Why? Because they were still rebellious in heart. He's causing his people to pass under the rod. If you look at that type in the Old Testament, that, that was the tithe of the sheep where he would, he would uh, the, 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 the sheep master would essentially stand here with the rod and there would be one, two, three, four, ten. Two, two, three, four, ten. And he would count out one-tenth of his sheep to give as the tithe. I believe God's doing the same thing, causing all of his people in this room to pass under the rod. Choosing, purging out the rebels, those that are transgressing, those that, that, that have, have hindered the walk of Christ, hindered the progress of the, of the kingdom of God, that have hindered their brothers and sisters, that have hindered their own walk and have, have completely rebelled against what God would have. He is taking them, purging them, doing something else with them while he collects 
for himself a nation that will be ready and zealous to perform the duties in the last days. This is what God's doing. This is why we see nations falling. It's why God's hand is stretched out. His anger. He's also stretching out in mercy. He's not turning away from the people that would call upon him. Turn to him. He's not, he's not, just, he's not forsaking those. But he will continue. And we'll continue to see it more and more and more. The Bible promised. I'm not just making this. I'm not a fortune teller. Okay, the Bible promised these things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. But in the life of a Christian, those temptations, signs, wonders, God's terror coming down, it shouldn't shock us. It should give us more faith, get us more excited about things of God, and get us more motivated to go out and preach the laws, get us more motivated to go out and work the works. Is more motivated to clean up our lives and to, and to purge out the things that are hindering us from knowing Him and walking in truth and righteousness. That's what it's got to do for Christians. As we see these things, behold, I have told you before, right? He said, He did that so we would not fear, right? <laughs> Honestly, I didn't. I didn't fear. I, I, I was going to roll back to bed and sleep like a baby when I thought there was a meltdown coming a few kilometers away from me, right? All I did was send a text. Hey, if you guys want to come over, you can. <laughs> and then I rolled over and went back to bed. Right? I'm not a perfect guy, but, but I know that God has promised these things. Right? We just got to trust Him. I hope this whole church is strolling with me on the sand. <laughs> and God pours out His fury, His anger, and His indignation upon a nation such as Canada that has rejected Him. That He could purge us and bring us as a nation unto Himself. A peculiar and treasured people. Father, I thank you.